What was more difficult for you, admitting that you were depressed or challenging the reasons you believed you were depressed? And what does that say to you about depression? They were both hard, but the second one was the hardest. It's a sign of how difficult it was. I wanted to write this book seven years ago. I decided it'd be easier to go off. It'd be easier, instead of investigating this question, I would find it easier to write a book that required me to go and spend time with hitmen for the Mexican drug cartels, right? I was really frightened of looking into this. Um, and there were many reasons why I felt emboldened to do it, partly because the crisis is so great for so many people. And there were some aspects of it. Uh, there were two that I found particularly challenging, two of the causes of depression and anxiety that I learned about that I found particularly challenging. One was, we all know that, because I felt it playing out in my own life so strongly, we all know that junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick. You don't have to walk very long anywhere in the Western world to see that. I learned that there's a similar process that's happened with our values, that the kind of junk values have taken over our minds and made us mentally sick. For thousands of years, philosophers have been saying, if you think life is about money and status and stuff, you're going to feel really bad. But weirdly, no one had actually scientifically investigated that until an amazing man I got to know at Knox College in Illinois called Professor Tim Kasser started to actually scientifically investigate it. So Professor Kasser knew there are basically two kinds of ways human beings can motivate themselves, right? So if you imagine, if you play the piano, which I don't, but if you do, if you play the piano in the morning because you love it and it gives you joy, that would be an intrinsic reason to play the piano, right? You're not doing it to get something out of it. You're doing it because that experience is what you want in life. And now imagine you play the piano, not because you want to do it, because I don't know, your parents want you to be a piano maestro and they're really pressuring you, or in a dive bar to pay the rent that you can't stand. That would be an extrinsic reason to do it. You're not doing it for the experience itself. You're doing it to get something else out of the experience, right? We're all a mixture of intrinsic and extrinsic motives, and we change throughout our lives. But what Professor Kasser found is the more you're driven by extrinsic values, the more you're driven by getting money or status or something else rather than the thing that you're actually doing, the more likely you are to become depressed and anxious by quite a considerable margin. This has been found in lots of studies now. Um, and, and, and I began to think of this as a kind of junk values that are akin to, akin to um, junk food that actually P Professor Kasser has shown extrinsic values have significant, significantly increased throughout our culture. There's a nice little experiment that I think shows what's been going on here. It was done in, before Professor Kasser, it's done in 1978. Um, you get a bunch of five-year-olds and you put them all in a sandbox and you split them into two groups. The first group is shown two advertisements for a specific toy. Second group is shown no advertisements. And then they get all the kids going and say, hey kids, you've all got a choice now. You can either play with a nice boy who doesn't have the toy that was in the ad, or you can play with a nasty boy who's got the toy. The kids who haven't seen the advert choose the nice boy. And the kids who have seen the advert choose the nasty boy with the toy. So just two advertisements primed people to choose an inferior connection, in fact, a nasty person and a lump of, with a lump of plastic over the possibility of connection and kindness, right? I think you can see how that plays out. I mean, I don't have to mention the name of your president. I try to avoid saying uh, that, you know, you can see how that plays out in people's lives. You can see how if you're obsessed with money and status and your wife being hot rather than being like a decent person or your husband being hot rather than being a decent person or your husband being rich rather than being a decent person, how that makes people more insecure hour by hour, day by day, how that mass and there's, there's many reasons why junk values make people feel worse. But, but our minds have really been hijacked by that. And I could see that playing out in myself, right? I, I could feel that. That was very challenging. We are speaking with Johan Hari. He is a New York Times bestselling author. He, his new book is Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions. Johan's been on our show several times. The last time was discussed his book, Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. You write that I have come to believe something that would have shocked me at the start of your investigation. We have been systematically misinformed about what depression and anxiety are. Is it simply based on bad assumptions, bad science, or do you think that it is some other institutional, even profit-driven reason we are misinformed about depression and anxiety? Is it some sort of cabal-driven conspiracy? It's not cabal-driven conspiracy at all. I think there's several factors going on. 
There's the easiest one to point out, which I don't think is the biggest, but I think is real and, in fact, has been established in court as real, which is obviously Big Pharma, right? Um, there's a $10 billion industry in, um, in selling these drugs, which do have some value, but don't solve the problem for most people. Um, and, you know, obviously these companies, and in fact, this was established in, has been established in court where these companies had to make big payouts many times, especially in New York State when Elliot Spitzer was the attorney general. Um, you know, they massively uh, oversold the drugs. They massively overpromised. You know, there's a process that was qu- quite shocking for me to be shown a, a leaked memo from the company that manufactured the antidepressant I took as a teenager, in which they admitted the antidepressant did not work for teenagers. And yet they were going to carry on marketing it because, as they put it, it would be unacceptable for the commercial profile of paroxetine to release these results. So, you know, there's definitely was an overselling going on there. I actually don't think that's the main thing going on. Um, I think there's a deeper, deeper thing going on. And it's related to something that you cover a lot, Chuck. It's about neoliberalism. So when I was a child, Margaret Thatcher said, there's no such thing as society. There's only individuals and their families. And that ideology was obviously promoted by Ronald Reagan as well. But actually, social things are not real. There's only the individual and the, you know, and their families and maximizing their rational economic interests. Really took, really won, right? And partly what I learned from all these scientists is that depression and anxiety are largely caused by social and psychological problems. There's real biological factors that can make it worse. But they're caused by these factors in the way we're living to a large degree. And if you live in a culture that says there's no such thing as society, talking about social causes is going to sound really strange. It's like speaking in Aramaic, right? It's interestingly why some people have just completely misunderstood what I'm saying. So if I say chemical imbalance theory isn't true, which for which the science is overwhelming, um, what they think I'm saying is, well, that means it's your fault that you are weak. We, we, we've only had this, this either it's the individual's responsibility and they're weak and they need to pull themselves together, or it's a biological fault. And if you come along and say, well, actually, the World Health Organization and all these people say that actually reality is a third option that it's caused by the way we're living, that's such a strange thing to say in a, in a neoliberal culture that people just literally, some people just literally can't understand what you're saying, what people like the World Health Organization are saying. So, you know, it really struck me, one of the places that most struck me, the, 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 the importance of this was uh, one of the other kind of anti... So I talk about these seven different kinds of antidepressant that we should think about and utilize alongside um, alongside chemical antidepressants in, in lost connections. And one of them, there was this doctor in East London uh, called Sam Everington. He's an incredible man. And it's a very poor part of East London, it's actually where I lived for a long time. And Sam was really uncomfortable. Because he had loads of people coming to him who were depressed and anxious. And when he listened to them, he could see that they were depressed and anxious for perfectly understandable reasons. Again, their pain made sense. And yet he'd been told in his training, even though he knew the science was, didn't say this, to just tell them you've got a chemical imbalance in your brain and offer them nothing like drugs. Like me, Sam's not opposed to chemical antidepressants. He still prescribes them sometimes, as I would if I was a doctor. But he just thought, this is not, this is not dealing with the reasons why they're depressed. So he began an, a really interesting experiment give you an example of how it worked through one of his patients who I got to know, a woman called Lisa Cunningham, came to Sam. Lisa had been shut away with crippling depression and anxiety for seven years. And Sam said to her, you know, I, I, I carry on giving you the drugs, don't worry. But I'm also going to prescribe something different. I'm going to prescribe for you to take part in a group. There was an area behind the doctor's surgery that was known, uh, it was an alleyway, it was like scrub, scrubland, basically, where dogs would go and mess in. And he said, what I'd like us to do, we're going to support you, is meet a couple of times a week and we're going to, with other depressed and anxious people. And I'd like you, as a group, to just turn this area into something beautiful. At the first meeting, Lisa was physically sick with anxiety. But as the weeks went on, she starts speaking to the other members of the group. They start to get to know each other. They started to teach themselves gardening. They were inner city people. They didn't know anything about the natural world. Actually, there's lots of evidence that disconnection from the natural world is a cause of depression and anxiety. And and they just start putting their fingers in the soil. They, they have something to talk about that's not how terrible they feel. And as human beings do when we come together in groups, they started to listen to each other's problems and solve them. There was one guy in the group who'd been sleeping on the bus. Um, Lisa was outraged. She starts pressuring the local authorities to get him an apartment, which then happened. It was the first thing she had done for someone else 
in years and it made her feel better than anything she'd done for herself. And as Lisa and other people put it to me, as the flowers began to bloom, they began to bloom. There was a study in Norway of a similar program that found it was twice as effective as chemical antidepressants, right, in moving people on the Hamilton scale we were talking about. And I think the reason is obvious, because it's actually dealing with why they felt so terrible. One of the, two of the key reasons, their disconnection from other people and their disconnection from the natural world, that were actually driving this depression and this, this despair in the first place. And that's, and, and coming back to, to your question, it's not in any way a conspiracy. A, um, a capitalist economy will only, um, you know, a kind of hyper-capitalist neoliberal economy will only look for solutions that can be monetized. There's a lot of money to be made in, in just drugging everyone in that group. And there's really no money to be made in them taking part in a gardening program. They reconnect with the natural world or very little money. And yet that program is twice as effective. So it's more that you get this distortion in the kind of economy we have where the, the solutions that can be monetized will be the only solutions that are you know, uh, promoted and explored most of the time.